Well, first off, I want to say thank you. Uh, thank you not only to our moderator, to the organizers, uh, but thank you for all of you coming out, and more importantly, uh, thank you for your interest. You know, about a year ago, year and a half ago, there were a lot of naysayers that said people like you and people like us weren't going to stay engaged in this process, and they were wrong. We see crowds all across the state that are anywhere from a third to half the size, or half as large, or excuse me, who are two or three times as large as we've seen before, and I should say anywhere from a third to half of those people are people that many times tell me they've never been involved before. They've never gotten involved in a campaign or a, a town hall meeting or a listening session, but there's too much at stake not to get involved at this time in this state and in this country. I'm running for governor because I love this state, and I believe in Wisconsin. But I believe this governor and his allies in Madison have taken us down the wrong track, and it's about time we stand up and demand our state government back. I know how to do that. I've done that before. Many of you know just down the way in Milwaukee County, we had that same challenge eight years ago, and we made it about we, not about me, and ultimately, we took our county government back, and we can do the same in this state. My values, my vision for this state come not just from where I live today in Wauwatosa with my wife, Toinette, and our two sons, Matt and Alex, but also from where I grew up. I grew up in a small town called Delavan, not too far down the way from here in Walworth County. And certainly my parents and my family, but also others in my community that went to church with, I was in scouts with, went to class with, my teachers and others played a tremendous impact on my life. But probably for me, my most endearing influence on where I was even that back then and even more so today came from my grandmother, Eleanor Fitch. My grandmother was raised during the Great Depression. In fact, she raised my mother along with my grandfather in a farmhouse where they didn't have indoor plumbing until my mother went off to high school. So she learned to be frugal and to get by doing more with less because she had to. And I think a lot of that rubbed off on me. It's why throughout this campaign, even before throughout my time as a county executive and before that in the state legislature, I've operated under that kind of common sense that came from my grandmother, or as I like to call it in this campaign, a little bit of brown bag common sense. It's three core principles. First off, my grandmother would love this. Don't spend more money than you have. Secondly, smaller government is better government. And third, probably the most important these days with our president, our governor, and even the mayor of Milwaukee, and that simple principle is people. People create jobs, not the government. You see, too many politicians in this state and in this country think it's the other way around. They think politicians create jobs and the government creates jobs. That's not the case. Government creates an environment that's either better or worse, positive or negative. And under this governor in Madison, we have a more negative environment. It is about time we stand up and take our government back and say we want a better environment. And the best way to get more people working in this state is to get government out of the way. It's why the plan I laid out starting earlier this year, a plan that's available on our website, scottwalker.org, talks about how to get the state working again by getting government out of the way, by lowering the cost of doing business, through things like cutting taxes, cutting through the red tape, cutting through the cost of out-of-control lawsuits in this state. These are the things we need to get government out of the way so we can put more people to work in this state. And it is a great state. I've traveled the state now for more than a year as a candidate for governor. I've got to tell you, the people of this state embody the Midwestern work ethic. They're the kind of people you build not only your company around, but ultimately your community and your state around. We've got phenomenal employers in this state, many times big or small anywhere in between, but many times two or three or four generations deep of family-owned businesses. And for those that aren't, they treat their employees like family. And they're rooted here. They're vested in this state. But more often than not, I hear from employers who are begging me begging me to get the government out of the way so they can hire more people to work in the state that they love. We're a state blessed with abundant natural resources. Think about it. No other state in the country is surrounded by two great lakes and the greatest river in the U.S. We're filled with 15,000 inland lakes. That's 5,000 more than Minnesota. Eat your heart out, Brett Farr. <laughs> For my money, having grown up in a small town and now living in the largest county in this state, I got to tell you, big or small or anywhere in between, there is no place in the world better to grow up in, to live in, to work in, to play in, to build a business in, to someday retire in. There is no place in the world better than our Wisconsin. What I found over this past year just reaffirms what I thought before, and that is it's not our people or our places who are failing us. It's our government. And the good news is come this November, we can change that. We, we the people of Wisconsin can stand up and reclaim our rightful place in history. We, the people of Wisconsin, can stand up and once and for all put the government back on the side of the people again. We, we, the people of Wisconsin, can make this a Wisconsin we can believe in again. I love this state. 
and I know it's time for us to make a change, and I'd ask for your vote to make that possible. I'd like to remind the audience, the more you clap, the fewer questions are going to get answered. So I guess my preference is that you would save the applause for the end. State and federal government have different roles. How are or should be these roles be defined? And uh, how do the roles of state and federal government conflict? How do they complement? And uh, what would you do to change the balance, if anything? And it's kind of a multi-part question. But basically, just talk in general principles about the role of federal government state go versus state government, where, th where they get their powers from, and uh, what those powers should be. Sure. You want to uh, no, you tell you're, us what you're, you're first, Scott. Okay. Well, simply put, the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the state of Wisconsin. Uh, very clearly lays that out, and if we had more people in Washington and Madison following that, we'd be a lot better off. Um, a lot of that conflict, when I talk to people around the state of Wisconsin campaigning the past year or so, people are frustrated. Uh, not the least of which, obviously, was with health care, but there's plenty of other issues as well. I don't know about you, but in general, I don't want the state nor the federal government telling me what to do with health care, but specifically when it comes to this health care mandate that was uh, thrust upon us. As governor, I can tell you one of the first things I'm going to do is walk across the, the, uh, the east wing, go over to the attorney general's office and give him the letter on the very first day I take office to allow our attorney general to join with more than two dozen states now who say, hey, let's read the Constitution and understand that it's the states that have these powers, and ultimately those powers come not from the Constitution, but from the people who approve, those con who approve the Constitution and continue to uphold them. As governor, I'm going to continue to push on that, uh, not only when it comes to health care, but other issues to make sure we abide by the Constitution of both the United States and the state of Wisconsin. Well, when it comes to health care, let, just m let me uh, expound a little bit. Not only do I object to the federal mandate, I object to a state mandate. The misnamed Healthy Wisconsin was anything but that. And i got to say again, I don't want the government at the state nor at the federal level telling me or my family what we can do with health care. Uh, earlier today, was, I was telling Mark and some of the others on the panel, my youngest son, Alex, uh, was playing football and had a pair of cleats come down on him when he was catching a pass. And about 18 stitches later, he's back at home now um, with his leg up, thankfully uh, a little bit better. And that's why I went from about 45 minutes before this in a pair of uh, uh, shorts and a t-shirt to quickly putting a suit on. But when I think about going to a place like that, I don't want the government in the future telling me whether I can go to Children's Hospital or whether I go to somewhere else. That's a decision that Tonette and I, our family, should make. And I don't want any level of government, the federal, the state, or anybody else, telling us what we can do. As long as I'm governor, we're going to continue to fight to preserve those rights for our families right here in the state of Wisconsin and not allow the government at any level to do that. That means not just tackling and challenging the mandate itself, Certainly by, uh, as I mentioned before, giving not only the authority, but telling our attorney general that our expectation is, and he will, because uh, he wanted to and the governor did not allow him to, but to join in that federal lawsuit. But I go beyond that, not only asking for a waiver, but going between now and November 2nd, not only in this race for governor, but I will support candidates for federal office in the House and the Senate in this, in this state of Wisconsin who are willing to stand up and say, we're going to repeal that mandate and give the power back to the states and ultimately to the people when it comes to health care. We need to stand up and make a decision now. And for those who feel helpless after that mandate was shoved down our throat earlier this year, the best way to fight back between now and November 2nd is to support candidates for a federal office who are willing to stand with the people and not with the federal government. Rebuttal. Well, only that uh, if, if you take a look at our health care plan, the health care system in Wisconsin and in America has a lot of problems. Problems from cost to access to maintaining quality of control as we have large companies um, move into the health care business. The conservative plan that we've laid out at our website deals with uh, ways to bring the cost down, such as insurance across, uh, across state lines, such as tax deductibility for all of your premiums, such as uh, limitations on uh, unintentional malpractice. It also provides access to every member and every person in the state of Wisconsin. Now, you have to pay for it. This is a conservative plan. It's not a government handout. 
but you, the bottom line is it has access for everyone. It specifically addresses the issue of health savings accounts, which is such an important part of solving the health care program. And I can talk for hours on health savings accounts because that's what we actually do in our company. We buy a $3,000 deductible policy for our people. They then uh, get $3,000 placed in a savings account on their behalf, so that's now their money. It's effectively a 100% coverage program. So what happens then is that when they go to get health care, and it's a true story, I know one of our employees needed an MRI. And they looked at their $3,000 in their health savings plan, and they let, said, how much? A question that doesn't get asked very often in, healthcare, in the health care issue. Doctor said $1,800, and I can tell you for a fact this happened. They're looking at their $3,000 account, and they ask, do I have any other options? The doctor said, you can go down the road for $1,200. I've got smart employees working for me. They said, are there any other options? <laughs> Doctor said you can drive. It's a storefront, but they do have an MRI machine that works just fine. It's 600 bucks. It's 30 miles from here. Folks, I can tell you for a fact that by asking that question, the cost of that health procedure was $600 instead of $1,800. Folks, we need thoughtful, conservative solutions to the issues in health care so that the cost remains in a manner that we in America and in the state of Wisconsin can afford health care for us and for our families and for future families in this state. Thank you. When, when you look at what they're talking about in Washington when they justify this mandate, they're talking about the issues of access and quality. Yet on nearly every measure, we rank in Wisconsin at nearly at the top, if not the top, when it comes to access and quality. We've got great health care systems like the one I mentioned before that Alex went to this morning. What's killing us, what I hear more often than not, particularly from small business owners, is cost. The problem is what they've pounded on us in Washington not only doesn't fix it, it makes it worse. It compounds that problem. We've got to make sure we not, the, the true solution is not more government-driven mandates. It's market-driven solutions that get government out of the way. It's things like eliminating the state tax and health savings accounts. We're one of four states left that still taxes health savings accounts. That's ridiculous. We've got to open the door and allow every employer, including public sector employers, to tap into that asset. We've got to make sure we have true disclosure and transparency when it comes to health care costs. So as an employer or individual, when you're making health care purchases, you actually know what you're getting. It doesn't differ from one place to the other. You know you can make the comparison. It's a true free market enterprise. Those are the things that are going to make a difference. Because in the end, there's only two ways to control cost. One, in the federal plan, which eventually, if they're true and truthful about trying to control cost, the only way they can ultimately get there is through rationing of care. And I don't think any of us here want that. The other option is to not control health care costs, but to better manage our own health. And the best way to do that is to have skin in the game, to be involved in the process. I know that full well. My wife, Tonette, for example, just found out a few years ago she's a type 1 diabetic. She's got a pump. She's got to make sure she's on top of that. She pricks her finger about 50 times a day to make sure she knows what her glucose count is. She's actively engaged in managing her diabetes. Unfortunately, for all too many other elements that we all have, we're not involved in that process. We don't know the cost difference. We don't know the quality differences. We're just told to go someplace. We need, and we don't get it through more government-driven mandates because it goes down the same path. We need to open the door towards more free market. That will ultimately help us control health care costs and better our health. Did you want to counter rebut or? Just a very brief second. Chapter 12 in our book. You can download this, by the way, for free at markfordove.com or order a copy if you prefer a hard copy. The health care plan is chapter 12 in the book, and you're sure welcome to take a good look at it because the details are there. Thank you. That's oh, fine. All right. Recently, nullification has become a hot topic throughout the United States. The REAL Act of 2005 was virtually nullified by a refusal of the states to implement it. How would you use nullification to restore the balance between the state and federal government powers? And could you give some examples of how you would, you know, what kind of actions you would uh, take toward what federal mandates? Well, I go back, back in terms of strategies overall, um, and, and it goes back to any of the number of challenges that we have. And, and I think it goes to a broader issue of, of uh, not only nullification, uh, but in terms of invoking the rights of the states. Um, we talked about the Tenth Amendment quite a bit earlier, but whether it's on health care uh, mandate that was shoved down the throats of our state and others, whether it's the federal government talking about uh, intervening in the Arizona case, uh, and trying to invoke a policy that says that the uh, 
that the state of Arizona is wrong, and I think, by the way, they're right, and think we should be doing the same thing here in Wisconsin. Uh, I think you go beyond that and other issues and saying we should be pointing out uh, via the Constitution what the rights of the states are, where we believe um, ultimately we stand, and, and be willing to protect that under any means possible. And as governor, that's precisely what I'm going to do. A lighter note, I should say, Mark, i got to find out where your tree stand is because last year, camera or not, I couldn't see any deer, and that really bothered me. Um, I hunt over in Crawford County, so I need to come closer to your stand, Mark. But the, uh, just to expound just for a second on, on immigration, and I want to touch one other quick thing with the federal government. Uh, but clearly, I think we're in agreement on that, that the, the bottom line is, in fact, I've got uh, two nephews that live down in Arizona, and one's an EMT, and he is completely frustrated with law enforcement or as part of law enforcement first responders down there because it's not just an immigration issue for them. It's almost a warlike issue, particularly the further you get to the southern part of, of the state of Arizona. And the federal government has completely failed not only the people of that state but the people across this country when it comes to enforcing our immigration laws. Here in Wisconsin, I will sign a law that parallels that of Arizona, and I take it a step further. I believe we shouldn't be providing public assistance, driver's licenses, or in-state tuition to anyone who's not here legally. Um, you shouldn't be able to get around the system in the same way you shouldn't be able to use other components in the federal law to get around coming into this country illegally. We should be rewarding those who follow the process and come into this country legally, and my arms are welcome to anyone, no matter where they come from, no matter what their origin, if they come into this country legally. The other part about telling the federal government no beyond health care and immigration and other issues they need to fix is what some, like President Obama and Ray LaHood and Jim Doyle and Tom Barrett would like to see go by this area, and that's spending $810 million, not of their money, but of our money as federal taxpayers on a so-called high-speed train line between Milwaukee and Madison that we don't want and can't afford. If I'm elected as governor, we will derail that train. It will be stopped dead in its tracks as one of many abuses they're trying to ram down us. It will not happen when I'm the governor. Well, if they, if they had us, first of all, we're going to replace the secretary in every other appointed position, not only there, but in every other state agency. I'm, I'm not keeping anybody Jim Dill currently has in office. Um, so if somehow someone tried to do that without us knowing, they'd be fired. That's the simple answer. Uh, they're not going to do it in our administration. Uh, they're not going around the law, not just on this and other issues, because to me, one of our problems, not just when it comes to that issue, and there's no way uh, we're giving um, driver's licenses or state-issued ID cards to anyone who's not in this country legally. But to, beyond that, one of our big challenges, uh, for, uh, both as individuals and as employers in this state, is that our state agencies have too broad power under the administrative code process. It's one of the things I saw in the legislature. We're one of the few states that has a broad a power base when it comes to administrative code process. For those who aren't familiar, what that means is uh, the administrative code essentially is brought forward by bureaucrats. And if no one objects and a committee chair isn't willing to hold a hearing on that, it goes into law, it goes into effect with the full f effect of the state statutes. That's wrong. You all elect us, either as a governor or a legislator, to make laws on behalf of you. We shouldn't be taking people who aren't elected and giving them the power to create laws. We've got to rein in that power, and whether it's the Department of Transportation, the Department of Natural Resources, Department of Commerce, you go down the list, we'd be a lot better off, a lot more efficient, a lot more effective if we left the lawmaking to the lawmakers and the governor and not to the bureaucrats. I plan on working another 30 years. That, <laughs> will you judge my career okay. when I'm 75 and still working, and the Lord knows the way the federal folks are going, I mean, we need to work to 85 to even qualify for Social Security <laughs> the way they're blowing our money. But I think that's the time to judge a career, but to judge who should be the next governor is to decide what their experience is, what they bring to the table, whether they get the job done and fulfill the promises they made on every one of those issues. I've done exactly that time and time again. It's why the people of my county who have never elected a Republican before have done it three times. Yes, uh, obviously, but the, but the larger question comes, I think the reason, at least the last eight years, they felt uncomfortable is because they had a, a governor that, one, didn't have a conservative approach, and two, more often than not, had people working for him that had questionable issues about following the law. Uh, as governor, I'm not only bringing a conservative approach uh, to this administration, I'm going to be one that values the rule of law in this state. And if you don't like the law, you change it or you advocate changing it. You don't go out and do, it, do an end around. Um, and we're going to tell people uh, uh, that ultimately, if you're going to work in our administration, you're going to follow those principles, you're going to follow that uh, vision, and you're going to ultimately realize that you don't work for the government, you work for the people. 
No, I'm fine. You can ask. Okay. What will you do as governor to create jobs and at what cost to the taxpayers? <laughs> and whose turn is it again? <laughs> I don't think we're up. Okay. We're, again, we're easy. We're pretty simple. Um, well, the bottom line, I started out with the premise that I don't think Jim Doyle, Tom Barrett, or Barack Obama understand, and that is government doesn't create jobs. <clears throat> People create jobs. The people of this state, the people of this country do. And so our plan, which we've laid out, which I alluded to in the opening statement, uh, scottwalker.org's got the details, but really ties into to, to six different categories. But before I tell you about that for a minute, let me just tell you. When I go around this state, and, and I not only go to give speeches or go to forums like we're at here, but go around a lot of times and stop at diners, and I go from booth to booth and table to table, I like to talk to people. You know, in fact, people tell you just about anything when they're eating. Um, and what people tell me over and over again from one end of the state to the other is that they're scared. They're scared about the economy. They're scared about their own job, about their spouse's job, about their kid's job, about their neighbor's job, about their employee's job. They're scared. Well, I'm here to tell you that come November 2nd, help is on the way. And it's not about the kind of blind hope we hear out of Washington. It's about real hope based on a real plan. For me, again, the details we talk about on our website, but it's about cutting taxes on individuals, on employers, capping off property taxes, even phasing out state taxes on retirement income. It's about cutting through the red tape so that the few regulations we have in the state are science-based and predictable. They're not all over the map. We rein in the administrative power. And we allow the few that we have to be through the legislative process those that are science-based and predictable. It's about cutting through the cost of litigation in the state. You know, you look at the states across the country, even in these tough economic times that have seen true economic growth, more jobs, more opportunity. They're the states that have lowered the cost of doing business. I want to be one of those states. Certainly you look at other things, healthcare we talked about quite a bit before, but even infrastructure. We need cost-effective and reliable sources of power, and we ultimately need a transportation system that's focused on fixing our roads and our bridges and not wasting $810 million on that so-called high-speed train line. Those are the things that we will enact. I feel so passionately about those, I put a number to it. 250,000 new jobs, we will help the people, not the government, but the people of the state create by 2015 if you elect me as governor. We will help the people do that. Under Governor Jim Doyle, the same things we're going to see continue if we get a third term of Jim Doyle with Tom Barrett. And that is the lack of a plan and the lack of a cheerleader. Because right now we've got a bureaucrat in chief. We've got someone who believes the way you solve our economic challenges in this state is more government, more bureaucracy, more spending, more taxes. What we need is more freedom, more opportunity, less government, getting government out of the way. And we need a cheerleader who's going to advocate not only to make those changes in the state government, but then to go out and tell our employers or show our employers, lead our employers about why things have changed and they can afford to stay and grow jobs here in the state of Wisconsin and why others from outside of our borders should do exactly the same. You know, in a microcosm of that, we've done that in Milwaukee County, even with all of our challenges. You know, coming in with all the sorts of challenges the next governor is going to face on a statewide level we faced eight years ago at the county. We cut our debt, reduced the size of our government workforce, presented eight straight budgets without a property tax levy from the previous year, and still had a surplus last year. But we did other things as well. You know, we run an airport that many people don't recognize, but literally this year, the first quarter of 2010, is the fastest growing airport in America. That helped us track nearly 1,000 new private sector jobs. We partnered with the city of Wauwatosa, where I live, out of the county research park, and we brought in GE Healthcare because we made it affordable for them to be there. That attracted nearly 2,000 high-paying uh, medical-related research-type jobs. We have shown in a microcosm of the state we can make it work even under tough, tough economic times. If you give me the honor of serving as your next governor, we're going to lead the charge by getting government out of the way and being a cheerleader. So that not our government grows, but our employment base grows outside of government, which is that's the way we ultimately get the state working again. Well, the only thing I can say is I'm a business owner, folks. Okay. <clears throat> you, you're both on record as opposing the high-speed high train between Madison and Milwaukee. Um, last week or the week before, the Secretary of Treasury said that high-speed rail is fait accompli and a change of governorship is not going to change that. Uh, your response to that, and what if the feds demand their money back? And I think it's Scott's turn. Okay. Uh, well, the answer I would say to Ray LaHood is just watch me. Uh, we've taken on those kind of challenges before, and we can take it on again. i got to tell you a couple quick things. One, I, I don't know about all of you, but I was just personally offended 
uh, that a federal official, with my money, with your money, with our money, would tell us that they controlled it, not the people. So right off the bat, that was just incredibly offensive. But the reality is we can stop that. The state of Wisconsin lets the contracts. The state of Wisconsin, the taxpayers of this state, will pay $10 million a year minimum just using their own numbers. We will pay up to $10 million a year to operate that track. We have much greater priorities when it comes to transportation alone from other things, but just looking at the roads and bridges and byways that need to be fixed here, you cannot force a state to do that. And I think the reality is his reaction was that because no one had briefed him because apparently Jim Doyle and Tom Barrett just believe that everyone thinks that's a great idea. Well, again, I don't know about you, but I don't think spending $14.5 million per job, because there's only 55 permanent jobs that come out as $810 million. And we all know it's a whole lot more money than $810 million. This is an 80-mile stretch. In California, they're spending $65 million per mile. There's no way it's going to be as little as that, but even if you use their own numbers, it is completely off the mark. Best example I give is how many people remember eight years ago the talk about the blue shirt at the airport? People remember that? Back then, they said that Tom Amitt had, had legally obligated Milwaukee County to put a three-story blue shirt on the side of the parking structure um, outside of our airport's parking garage. Well, they said they couldn't do it. The lawyer said you couldn't stop it. The pundit said you couldn't stop it. The editorial board said I was wrong for trying to stop it. If you go by the airport today, you don't see a blue shirt on the side of that structure. It's because I said the same thing then, and I say today about the train. Just watch me. We stopped it then. We'll stop the train in the future. And I said, well, it's kind of like being on a diet. If you're on a diet and you eat a, eat a donut, you don't stop and go, oh, I'm going to eat the whole box, right? I mean, the reality is we can't afford nor do we want that train. So no matter how much they put in, a, couple, you know, a few million in, we're still better off sending the money back. Now, I think it's outrageous. I think it is financial malpractice, not only by this president and this secretary, but by this governor and the other advocates like Tom Barrett who are pushing for this to for one minute be trying to put that kind of money in the ground when they know that the majority of us don't want it and they know that it's likely there's going to be a new governor who's going to stop it. But the reality is we're better off even if we have to send in the money back because we can't afford to pay for it in the future. Now, I think there are other options to, to, to not have to send it back, but the bottom line is we can't afford it. We shouldn't have to take it. We don't want it as governor. I will stop it dead in its tracks, and I plan on reminding the President of the United States of that very fact tomorrow when he's in town raising money for Mayor Ma May Milwaukee Mayor Tom Barrett. Sure, I mean, you go scout. They always taught us your campsite should be cleaner when you leave than when you found it. So I'm all for being green. But being green to me should be about making green or saving green, not about taking more green on my wallet. And unfortunately, Jim Dole and Tom Barrett want to take more green out of our wallets and your purses and everything else. The reality is the Global Warming Task Force legislation that Jim Doyle tried to push through this last legisl legislative session, and Tom Barrett has made clear would be a priority if he's elected as governor, will cost us 43,000 jobs in this state at a time when we can't afford to lose 43, let alone 43,000. And it won't just cost manufacturers and paper mills and, and farms and others out there. It will cost all of us as individuals because it'll be higher fuel costs, higher utility costs, higher costs to do business and to live in the state of Wisconsin. That's wrong. That's because they're trying to mandate things. It's the same thing we see with the president and others in Washington with cap and trade or more appropriately cap and tax. We need to stop that. The best way to open the door towards alternatives is to get government out of the way, to put more money back in the hands of the, of the people of the state and of this country and allow people to make those decisions. You know, I was at earlier this year at a company in Manitowoc called um, uh, Orion Energy, and they make a product called Apollo, which has these kind of sun domes where they put them in large-scale manufacturing sites, warehouses, and things of that nature. The interesting thing about that is under the current mandate, there's a 10% mandate. They don't even qualify for that because they don't produce any energy. It shows you what's fundamentally wrong about those mandates in the first place. They're a good product because they save people money. If they save people money, that's what you need. To be environmentally sustainable, it's got to be economically sustainable. It shouldn't take the government making that possible. It should be the marketplace that drives those decisions. As governor, I'm going to get government out of the way so we can do more things and allow the market to drive those decisions. You want to rebut or you should move on? I think he just said almost, I think that he said almost the same thing. So we're good. Moves. Okay. That's what I thought. <clears throat> 
Are you considering an evaluation of school districts' performance? A, how often? B, what tools other than standardized tests will be part of that process? C, who funds the evaluation, local or state? And it's uh, Scott's turn to go first. Well, I think for every school district, for every school, for every administrator, and ultimately every, for every teacher, parents should have uh, the opportunity to be involved in, in that process of understanding the quality of the education they're getting. You know, there are thousands of reasons to be for a great education system in this state. Well, it's a public setting, a private setting, or homeschool setting. Tonette and I have two. They're called Matt and Alex. And for every one of you who's a parent or a grandparent or just cares about kids in this state, you know how important it is to have a great education system. Your students perform well, we should reward you. At least our school district should have the opportunity to do that. If you don't teach well or your students don't perform well, uh, we should help you. And ultimately, if they continue not to do well, we should find someone to replace you. Because in the end, education is one of the most important elements when it comes to job growth and creation in this state. We can't just sit back and allow the status quo to continue. We've got to continuously improve the options for education in this state. But you empower that by giving the, or you make that possible by empowering people at the local level to make those determinations and then hold people accountable. And that allow large, you know, political entities at the state level like we act to be the ones that scare down the governor and the legislature from empowering parents, teachers, and the communities to make those decisions. Scott. I absolutely support a taxpayer's bill of rights. I've advocated for that in the past publicly um, in, in multiple ways. Uh, but I want to tell you why that's important. Uh, right after I got elected as county executive, uh, I got a card for Christmas that first December. And it was from a guy in his 80s by the name of Bob Bitters. Uh, Bob lives in the southwest corner of my county, and he sent me a Christmas card, and inside it he sent a copy of his property tax bill. Now, for most politicians, that's a dangerous thing. But circled on all the lists, and you know your property tax bill, city, county, a little bit of the state for the forestry fund, the technical school district, all those things on there were the list of every part of his property tax bill. And only one was circled. It was the counties. You see, that was the only part of his property tax bill that went down that year. And he said, thank you. It's a very Merry Christmas because at least somebody is listening to my pain. It's guys like Bob Bitters is the why. In 2002, I made a pledge that I would not propose a property tax levy in any of the budgets I presented. It's why I've kept that pledge every year. It's why when I was in the state legislature, I was proud to have voted for the largest tax increase, excuse me, largest property tax decrease in state history, the largest income tax cut in state history. And as governor, I'm going to pursue an agenda that cuts taxes across the board for everyone. Employers, individuals, caps off property tax, even phases out state taxes on retirement income so we can keep more of our retirees in the state and not see their wealth go down to Sedona and Naples and other places across this country. You ask Bob Bitters and he'll tell you there's no greater friend that he or any other taxpayer in my county has had than their county executive. As governor, I want to be that great champion for the people of this state and I want to ensure that part of our lasting legacy is making sure that we put in place a taxpayer's bill of right so that the people of the state can ultimately thwart off any future governor or future legislature who tries to chip away at that legacy of lower taxes after we're done as your governor. Closing statements, gentlemen. You have five minutes. Scott. Sure. Well, again, thank you for moderating, and thank you all of you for, for coming out here. I appreciate the time to share and the opportunity. It's, uh, it, it's been a lot of fun on the campaign trail. You know, you heard a lot today, and you're going to hear a lot uh, along the campaign, and you're going to hear a lot more after the primary I as well. Uh, there's, there's one group, I, I think there's a lot of agreement here, but there's one group of people out there that are going to tell you the answers are all with the government. You certainly don't hear that from me. If you want to reform the state government, I would tell you simply this, elect a reformer. If you want to put the government back on the side of the people again, elect someone who's got a track record doing exactly that. In fact, I would argue there's no candidate in this election, Republican or Democrat alike, who's inherited a problem more like what the next governor will face than what I inherited eight years ago. There's no candidate who inherited a problem of major retirement issues, out of control spending, 
property tax levies that went up 55% under my predecessor. Absolute dissatisfaction with governor and took through that challenge on head on. Head on. Ultimately, if you look at what the next governor is going to inherit and you need to wonder what will happen in the future, just look at our record. Eight years ago, after we inherited that absolute mess, and we didn't do it through me, we did it through a movement all throughout our county of neighbors standing up shoulder to shoulder, neighbor to neighbor, and taking back our government. We listened to the people and made bold promises and met every single one of them. Think about it. Over eight years, we've cut our debt, reduced the size of our government workforce. Because of that, improved our bond rating, presented eight consecutive budgets without raising the property tax levy from the previous year. And last year, we actually had a surplus when the state of Wisconsin had the largest deficit ever. We have shown we can get the job done. I mentioned to you just a moment ago a little bit about Bob Bitters, but there's people like Bob Bitters all across the state who need a champion as well. Ultimately, we've made bold promises, and we delivered not only for Bob. We Heck, I even did something that there's still people that bump into me all the time who say they can't believe it. Tonette may throw a shoe at me for bringing this up. But eight years ago, we found out that the county executive made more than the governor of the state of Wisconsin. In over eight years, we've given back $370,000 of our pay back to the taxpayers. Now, some people may say, so what? But I think that's important to show if you're going to provide leadership, you provide it in your own home and expect everybody else to do the same. If we're going to get this state back on track, we're going to need that same kind of leadership. And the reason I bring that up, as well as all the other pledges we made along the campaign, we made bold pledges back then. We are making bold pledges today. And we're actually able to fulfill them. We're able to get the job done. Eight years ago, I said something interesting that I, I think today is even more appropriate. I said, you know, it's not about Republican or Democrat. It's not just about whether you stand on the right or you stand on the left. Ultimately, it's about who amongst us knows the difference between what is right and what is wrong, who is willing to lead, and who's going to get out of the way. We are ready to lead. Help is on the way. If you want less government and you want lower taxes, I'm Scott Walker, and I know how to get the job done. I'm asking for your support. I'm asking for your vote, and I'm asking you to hire me as the next governor of the state of Wisconsin. Thank you. Okay. Um, there's a lot. Um, I guess we're all here. Sure. Okay. okay. Um, there's been... I've listened to two of your debates now, and yeah. the vision for the future sounds very similar. It's the background where I hear difference. Yeah. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, the bottom line is the case we're making is, unlike any candidate, Republican or Democrat, uh, we are actually the only candidate who's inherited the same sorts of problems that the next governor will face here in the state of Wisconsin and, and yeah. took them on the way I think the majority of voters not only here at this session, but other sessions of life. Reducing the size of our debt, cutting the size of our government workforce, doing it without proposing tax increases, still having a surplus, those are the things that I think people across the state expect out of these. I keep hearing Mark Newman raise his academic background and all the degrees that he has. Uh, and you shy away from talking about your college experience. What should people know about why you didn't finish at Marquette? Yeah, bottom line is I was offered a job. Um, like any person that's going to their senior year, right now, particularly in this economy, if they were offered a job at senior year of, high, of college, I think most people these days would take it. That's what I did at the American Republic. Should the governor of Wisconsin have a college degree? Uh, no, I think they, the bottom line is it's great, and I'm going to push an agenda that uh, pushes more and more graduates in the state. I certainly hope my kids end up graduating from a college or university, be it public or private in the state. But the bottom line is I think people should look at our experience. Who's best fit uh, to run this state? Who's got the best track record? Who's taken and has the experience putting the government back on the side of the people? Get it. We've done that in Milwaukee County. We can take on the machine there. We can take on the machine in Madison. Mr. Walker, are you suggesting that if, if, you have, if you're a senior in college, halfway through and somebody offers them a job, they shouldn't finish college, but you take the job? Right right now, if, if people, I think there are plenty of people who have given that opportunity right now, who would take? To me, that's a decision they have to make in this tough economic time. But I know for me, having that opportunity was something that was worthwhile at that time. Um, the, the bottom line is we're going to push for more graduates in the state regardless of what they think. With regard to immigration, you talked about supporting Arizona's law. What do you think of this talk of repealing the 14th Amendment? Well, I, I would support a change. I think the bottom line is we should not 
uh, allow any law or any piece of the Constitution or the Bill or, or of amendments to the Constitution to be misused to the point where they allow people to come into this country illegally and take advantage of that amendment. The bottom line, though, is in the more immediate sense, what we can do in Wisconsin, we can pass legislation next year right away that uh, pacifies what they've done in Arizona. They say, we're going to enforce the law of the federal government, even though the federal government's not going to. And we're going to take it a step beyond that and say, if you're not in the state legally, you're not going to get public assistance, you're not going to get an ID or a state-issued uh, driver's license, and you're not going to get in-state tuition. But should children of illegal immigrants born in Wisconsin be granted citizenship? No, the, the bottom line is we shouldn't be allowing people to come in illegally. And, and this is that would be one more measure that rewards people to come into the state. The federal government should ultimately step up and enforce the law, and if they're not going to, states like Arizona and certainly Wisconsin should have the right to do the same. What do you think about uh, President Obama coming to campaign for who would be your opponent, Tom Barrett? Well, I, if I had a chance to be there uh, tomorrow, I didn't get invited, but I'd certainly love to stand next to the president. Monday, right? Um, yeah, excuse me, Monday, which day it is. But if I had a chance to appear on Monday with the president, uh, I'd flat out tell him that the people of this state do not want $810 million of their taxpayers' money. Uh, the federal government's money, which we all pay, we pay federal income taxes in this state, being spent on a boondoggle like the so-called I-3 lane between Milwaukee and Manus. Uh, that's something that uh, I think is is a problem. It's certainly a, a bad deal for the taxpayers, and it's something that I think the voters of this state, when they look at Jim Doyle and Tom Barrett and, and uh, President Obama all supporting that, uh, are going to have a negative taste in their mouth and want something better. And last question. You said, you said that you were going to talk. You said that on Monday you were going to talk to him. I'm going to send a message. I'm going to have a press a rally uh, with supporters who support my point of view. And certainly we hope that sends a message uh, to, the, uh, to the president. I think the last time he came to Wisconsin, uh, when we took out a full-page ad in the Racine newspaper and pointed out the error of his radical environmental agenda that was threatening the jobs at Osiris and those associated jobs connected to that, it was one of the main factors in which they backed off and, and reversed their radical environmental agenda. My hope is the more pressure we can put on them and realize it's a political liability not only for the president, uh, but for his endorsed candidate, the candidate that he brought into this race. Um, let's face it, Tom Barrett was a reluctant candidate uh, until Barack Obama and the White House came in and put the pressure on him. I may be old-fashioned, but I think the people of the state should pick the next governor, not the president of the United States, and I think they're going to be reminded of that again on Monday. Just Thanks, really, Scott. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.